Our scripture reading this morning is Genesis 19, verses 1 through 29. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life, do not look behind, Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? and my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So I don't enjoy punishing my children, and I I hope they know that. I try to do whatever I can so I don't have to punish them. I warn them not to do things. I let them know if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. And then when they do it anyway, I tell them, if you keep doing that, 
then I have to give you a consequence, whether it's a spanking, which is Abel's least favorite, or you know, time out on the bed or whatever it is. But if I give them a rule, if I tell them not to do something, I expect them to obey. And when they don't, I have to punish them. Because I expect immediate obedience from my kids. I don't expect them to just get around to it whenever it's convenient for them. If they're told to do something, they're expected to do it when they're told to do it. But I punish my children because I love them. First and foremost, I'm trying to point them to God. I'm also trying to protect them. A lot of the rules we have are to keep them safe. And I also explain why they're being punished. Now, sometimes my explanations are more torturous than the punishment itself. There's been times when I know my kids just want me to be quiet and leave the room and you know, let them sulk on my bed, but I'm not done preaching to them, I guess. But God also does not enjoy punishing his children. He doesn't punish the innocent. He gives warning. Even Adam and Eve were warned, do not eat of that fruit. They ate from it anyway, and there was punishment. And just look at the prophets, all the warnings that they gave to, uh, to Israel, to Judah, and yet they still disobeyed and there was punishment. Uh, he delays punishment. We have our whole lives to repent. You know, he could have destroyed Adam and Eve immediately, uh, but they still live for over 900 years. And he has mercy on us and he gives us second chances, third chances, countless chances to repent. And he always explains why he punishes his people. In today's passage, we're told why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. But God punishes because he loves us. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father of the son in whom he delights. Now, just because you're going through a difficult time, that doesn't mean you're being punished by God. But look at Job. Job lost just about everything. You know, if that was, had been punishment, that was severe punishment. But he was a righteous man. He wasn't deserving of any of that punishment. And God allowed it to happen to him for a reason. But it wasn't God punishing him. Uh, Jesus suffered. Uh, he suffered for us. He was punished for things that we did, for things that everyone who has ever lived has done. But Jesus wasn't punished by God. And Paul, Paul was punished. He was stoned, he was beaten, he was put in jail. Other disciples and apostles also were. But they weren't being punished by God. They went through tremendously difficult times. But it wasn't punishment. So just because you're going through a hard time doesn't mean you're being punished by God. Let's look at a few things from what we just read. Uh, first, we see in verse 1 that Lot was sitting in the gate. That means that he was a leader in the community. And one of the verses talked about how he was new to the community but considered himself a judge. So he was sitting in the gate. He was a leader in the community, even though he was new to it. And like Abraham, he immediately recognized the angels when he saw them. He knew that they had been sent from God, and he bowed before them. And then he insisted that they stay with him. And he made a feast for them. So like Abraham, when he saw the men, Lot recognized that they were special, that they had been sent from God, and he treated them accordingly. And again, it's a reminder to us to uh, have our eyes open to see when God has placed someone of importance in our lives. Then we see in verses four through, my, four through nine that all of the men of the city, both young and old, from every quarter, surrounded the house. And Lot tried to protect the angels. He even offers his daughters uh, to the men, which on the one hand sounds terrible. I can't imagine offering up my daughter Katie to a group of men who were wanting to do terrible things. 
But on the other hand, what are we willing to sacrifice for God? You know, a little bit later, we'll, be, we'll get to Abraham being told to offer, sacri- uh, to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And I hope that God never asks us to do anything like that. But we need to be thinking, what are we willing to do for God? If God asks us uh, to do something, will we answer the call? And then we see that the angels save Lot and themselves in verses 10 and 11. Now, the angels could have stopped the confrontation before it even started, but allowing it to happen accomplishes two things. The first, it shows how evil the people were. The fact that all men from every quarter of the city, both young and old, were pressing in, trying to get to these men. It shows how widespread the evil was. You know, Abraham had tried to bargain with God. If you can just find ten righteous, will you not destroy the city? And he couldn't even find ten righteous. And this passage shows how evil the people were. But also shows where, where Lot's heart was. I think this was probably a test for Lot to see if, if he was, what he was willing to do for God. Was he willing to protect these men? And he was even willing to offer his daughters up to protect these men. I noticed he didn't offer himself up to protect the men, but it showed that Lot didn't just turn on the men. He tried to protect them. And then we see that Lot, his wife, and his daughters are transported out of Sodom. Now, they were told to leave. This was a mandatory evacuation. You know, they were told to leave, but they were... They kept waiting around, waiting around, not leaving. The sons-in-law thought it was a joke. They didn't evacuate. And so the angels transported them out of the city. And then Sodom and Gomorrah are completely destroyed by fire and brimstone. All living things were destroyed. Even the, the plants, the grass, everything was destroyed. And we see that Lot's wife looks back and is punished immediately. And then we read that Abraham sees the destruction. And he may have been wondering if Lot was okay. I know all of us with this past storm, we had loved ones in different places and we wondered if they were okay. And we had loved ones checking on us, wondering if we were okay. Well, Lot couldn't just pick up a phone and you know, check to see if, I mean, Abraham couldn't pick up a phone to check on Lot and see if he was okay. But you know, just imagine Lot, Abraham looking out over that destruction and, you know, wondering if Lot made it out okay. You know, maybe God told him Lot's okay, we don't know. But it says in verse 29 that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. So Abraham already physically went and rescued Lot once uh, when there was the, the battle and Abraham took the men and rescued Lot. So he's already saved him once. And now God remembers Abraham, and Lot is saved again. But you read this, and there doesn't seem to be a warning for Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no record of a prophet going to Sodom, you know, warning them, repent, or God's going to destroy you. And so you might wonder, is it really fair that God destroyed these two cities without warning them first, because there's no record of them being warned. Let's turn to Romans 1. I'm going to read verses 16 through chapter 2, verse 11. I think our question will be answered. Starting at verse 16 of chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation, For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the, the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful in receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. When I read that, uh, those last several verses, I was thinking of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it kind of describes um, some of the behavior that we know about that went on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But lest we think that this passage is just talking about people besides ourselves, let's continue. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath in revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So it's, it's easy for us to look on Sodom and Gomorrah or to look on any of the cities in in our country or around the world and say, yeah, the Bible's talking about them. They deserve punishment. But when we do that, you know, we're judging them, we're condemning them, and we're not innocent ourselves. You know, we've all done something wrong. We've all sinned in some way, done something to offend God. Uh, so we are all without excuse. I think the passage shows that Sodom and Gomorrah were without excuse, and any of us alive today are without excuse. Whether we've picked up a Bible and read it or not, God has revealed himself to his creation, and people have either chosen to accept him and worship him or to reject him and to disobey. So the passage also makes it clear that there is a day of judgment coming, and we are all without excuse. Now, the purpose of this message is not to scare you into repentance. Um, the, there was a time many years ago when Grace and I took the youth to, uh, it's like a haunted house. It was over at First Baptist uh, downtown. But 
you know, you, you go through this place and different rooms are set up. I think it was like a plane crash or something. And, but the, the room at the end was supposed to give you an idea of what, of what hell was like. Like they had the heat, you know, turned up as high as it was, as high as it would go. So it was like 110 degrees or something in this room, but it was supposed to, you know, and then when you're in this room, you hear, you know, like screams of anguish and the, the purpose of the thing was try to scare you into repentance, you know, to scare you into accepting Jesus as your savior. And yes, God, God describes some of what the punishment is going to be like. Uh, yes, scripture tells us about the curses for disobedience, but he also tells us about the blessings for obedience. And so the purpose of my message today is to not scare you into repentance, but to see that God loves you and for you to repent out of love for God. Uh, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we should be focused on the joy that is set before us, on, on what lies ahead and not, not looking behind us. Lot's wife was punished for looking behind her. We should learn from Lot's wife's mistake and not look behind us. Our past life, that person we were before, that's not who we are now. We don't need to, to look back and dwell on that. That's behind us. We need to look forward to, to Jesus, to the goal that he has set for us. He has a purpose for us, something that we're uh, supposed to be striving for. And the more we look behind us, the more we'll trip and stumble and uh, get injured along the way trying to, to reach our goal, our destination. So don't, don't keep looking back. Let the old person go. Let your past go. Certainly learn from those mistakes, but then turn from them and don't dwell on them. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. God wants us to obey out of love, not out of fear. I don't want any of my kids to obey me because they're scared of me. I want my kids to have a healthy respect for me, but I don't want them to be afraid of me. I want them to obey me because they love me. And God wants us to obey him because we love him, not because we fear him. Now, fear can be a deterrent. Like, I don't touch something that's hot because I know it, it's going to burn, it's going to hurt. And so there's that healthy respect for fire. I don't play with it. I don't touch it. And Grace has banned me from playing with propane, which can sometimes cause explosions, and people get burned in propane gas explosions. Uh, but, you know, so we should have a healthy respect for, for danger, but we shouldn't live in fear of it. It shouldn't consume us. We shouldn't be consumed by fear. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So fear does not come from God. In 1 John 4, 17 through 19, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now, none of us can leave here today and say, why didn't you warn me? We've all been warned. We all knew that Hurricane Irma was coming, and most of us took precautions. We made preparations, but some people you know, probably ignored the warnings. I know there were uh, people that, there's always every year, people that refuse to leave Key West, no matter how much they're warned. 
and sometimes they survive, sometimes they don't. But they knew the storm was coming, and we know that a day of judgment is coming. So we need to prepare for it, uh, not out of fear, but out of love. So God has warned us because he loves us not to make us afraid. So let his perfect love cast out your fear and then run with endurance to the joy that is set before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us, for having mercy on us. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. Thank you for warning us that uh, there is a punishment for disobedience. And Father, thank you for having mercy on us, for giving us a way out so we don't have to endure the eternal punishment that might be waiting for us otherwise. And Father, I pray that you will uh, give us strength to make it through the difficult times that we face in life. Uh, help us to discern uh, when we are dealing with the consequence of disobedience and help us know when we are suffering for some other reason. But regardless of what the source of our pain or suffering is, we know that we can turn to you to help us through it. That you will take our pain, take our burdens, that you will give us peace. And Father, I just pray that now we will live lives that glorify you, that honor you, that demonstrate our love for you and our love for each other. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.